it's rough And it takes all that you've got But he's been here Just waiting for you to knock To take his hand Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guest is Dr. Meg Meeker. She is an author, a speaker, a doctor, and a mom, most importantly. But she's come to speak to us this evening about the role of fathers and mothers in the development of children in the family and the importance uh, that they have. So, one sense obvious topic, but I think it's something that needs to be championed today and really taught to our young people. So, good to see you, Doug. You too, Padre. So, we're squarely in Advent. Right, and we are on a journey. Right. We are right, right, right in the thick of it. Right in the thick of it. And I yeah. recently read a beautiful reflection by our Holy Father on on Advent. And you know, we have all these images, right? We have John the Baptist. We have Mary figuring in the Advent uh, season in a large way. And we also we hear from Isaiah, we, uh, from the prophet Isaiah. He speaks of the mountain of the Lord, and he speaks about this great banquet and feast on the mm -hmm. mountain of the Lord and we're journeying to that and, and all people are streaming towards this mountain. And it speaks of this coming Messiah Jesus who's going to offer this new uh, universal, universalism to salvation that's going to be offered to all peoples, not just the people of Israel. And it also speaks of this fulfillment that you know the mountain of the Lord is Jerusalem where the temple is and that Jesus is uh, the new temple and he fulfills that. And our Holy Father talks about these themes in this reflection and he says, today, the first Sunday, this is from first Sunday of Advent, we begin a new liturgical year. That is a new journey of the people of God with Jesus, our shepherd, who guides us through history toward the fulfillment of the kingdom. I just love that one sentence, mm -hmm. you know, because we are on a journey, right? Because we hear these, these readings from Isaiah about, you know, swords will be beaten into plowshares in this new era of peace. And, and we know that Jesus has begun the kingdom. He's inaugurated it from his cross when he was lifted up, drawing all men to himself. But we also know there's a coming fulfillment where this peace will be fully realized, where this heavenly banquet feast that we'll be able to, to enjoy. So the kingdom is embracing all people, right? We, we enter it through faith and conversion, through baptism, the sacraments. And we're journeying toward it because there's a not yet about it. Right? Hmm. There's a not yet aspect that's yearning for fulfillment. He says it's a universal pilgrimage toward a common goal, which in the Old Testament is Jerusalem, where the Lord's temple stands, because from there, from Jerusalem, comes the revelation of the face of God and his law. Revelation found its fulfillment in Jesus Christ, and he himself is the Lord's temple, the Word made flesh. And he reflects, he says, you know, about when this will happen, this peace. He says, what a beautiful day. It will be when weapons are destroyed to be transformed into tools for work. What a beautiful day that will be. And that is, and this is possible. Let us bet on hope, on the hope of peace, and it will be possible. He says, the journey is never finished. Just as in the life of each one of us, there is always a need to start again, to get back up, to rediscover the meaning of our existence, so for the great human family, it is necessary always to redirect ourselves toward the common horizon that is the goal of our journey. <clears throat> and that's one thing I love about the liturgical seasons, right? They fire us up mm. uh, to get back on the horse, to repent, to be on the journey. And that's something we all need, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, and, and the fact that the church has this set up with these uh, different aspects of the, of the liturgical year and the different seasons, um, it, there's a discipline behind it. You know, you think about uh, the reality that we're all being trained or training ourselves in different things in life. Uh, we, we, we kind of fall into reaction to how we've been trained or formed or shaped to react, such as in a self-defense situation. Someone mm -hmm. grabs you, you react in a certain way, it becomes second nature because you've gone over and over and over and over and over again. Same idea here spiritually, the sense of the church every year gives us these seasons to go through to keep forming and shaping and training us mm -hmm. in, in that spiritual life to, to cause us and move, and move us to something much deeper, right. much right. more profound, much more fulfilling. Right. You know, so many people go through life so lonely, so sad, so 
empty. I feel empty, even in a crowd of people with, mm -hmm. you know, a gazillion friends on Facebook. Why do I still feel empty? You know, because mm -hmm. there's, a, there's still something missing and lacking inside, and it's Christ. And something like Advent gives us that opportunity to really focus and, and, and go to that center of, uh, uh, of what, what really matters most, right. the presence and of God in our lives. Yeah, that's what Advent's uh, preparation for the coming of Christ. Advent means arrival. Jesus is coming at Christmas. And, and these journey themes reminds us that the whole, the whole year, our whole lifetime is about journeying to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And this Advent, we're preparing for his coming at Christmas, you know, coming in a new way to break into our hearts. And uh, I was struck by something, um, you know, last Sunday we had the reading about John the Baptist. And he, you know, he's doing the baptism of repentance in the Jordan River. Scribes and Pharisees come up, but they're not really in it, right? They're not all in, so to speak. You're not buying it totally. Yeah. And he says, produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance. Right. If you scribes or Pharisees are serious about this, where are the fruits? Yeah. Produce good fruit. And I think that's a wonderful theme to have. Anything John the Baptist says, especially during Advent, is that we need to be doing these good works. You know, if we're converted to the Lord, if we are believers, <laughs> We have to be seeking His will, right? It's not enough just to say, Lord, Lord, we must do the will of the Father. And it's a time to focus on the good works, and that helps to increase our faith and certainly uh, to connect us to one another and open us to, to Christ's love. Well, I would think anybody, you know, any of us who are married out there realizes that you can't just say to your spouse, I love you. Uh, there needs to be proof or evidence of the love in the way you live. It has to be right. lived out. Right. The wedding vows or vows taken until death do you part. And to, to just say those words and then not live those vows out is not giving evidence or proof of our conviction or our commitment or our right. vow. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and all the more when it comes to our faith. You know? So it is, John the Baptist uh, saying that is, is, a, is a powerful reminder that there must be a manifestation of that faith and that love that we say we are about in that relationship with God lived out in day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. and reaching out to other people right. with it. And it, it manifests it and it quickens it, right? It drives that faith yeah. forward. I also need to give a little uh, bullet point here to uh, our point about Father John Paul is leading a pilgrimage. He's gonna be the chaplain on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land coming up in May. Uh, I think it's uh, about mid-May. We have a, he's gonna lead a pilgrimage May 15th. And you can uh, find out more about it at the website uh, visitationpilgrimages.com if you'd like to join him. I know they try to keep the costs down and, and they have a great uh, spiritual journey through the Holy Land, the fifth gospel. And you can find out more also by calling 1-800-535-9803. So we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be back with Dr. Meg Meeker. Don't go away. Welcome back. Tonight our guest is Dr. Meg Meeker, uh, author and uh, mom and speaker, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Father. It's how great many, to be here. How many books have you written? Well, I'm finishing, um, I just finished six, my mm. sixth book, and it comes out in April, and it's on mothers and sons. Okay, and you are a pediatrician yes. by training. Yep. How yep. many years have you I spent? have um, been practicing, oh gosh, about 30. And I practice with my husband, who's also a pediatrician and an internist, and it's fun. I, I love my job. And you've had a lot of interaction with uh, young people I and have. parents. And you know, I, I really, Father, I, I kind of consider myself a professional listener mm -hmm. because I love to listen to people's stories. I love to watch parents interact with their kids. And I think that I've learned over the years, um, you know, how kids see their parents and, and how, what parents can do to draw closer to the kids, help their kids, heal their kids. So really just by watching and listening, I've learned a tremendous amount. Right. That's what we hope to do tonight on the show is prevent, uh, present a, a vision of marriage and family and parenting. And uh, let's start with the role of the father because he, the poor dad gets kicked around so much today. Oh, yeah. It's almost like a, a, a criticism to call a man father or dad or something that's patriarchal or something. But uh, 
You tell you open your book uh, about mothers and or fathers and daughters with a story from your own life about your dad. Can you tell yes, us? Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. I um, I opened my book with a story about my own father, um, who was was a great supporter of mine. My father's no longer here; he's passed on. But when I graduated college, I wanted to do one thing, and that was go to medical school. So I applied to all these medical schools and had worked very very hard for a number of years, and I got rejection after rejection after rejection. And I really felt despondent. I thought my life is over. You know, I was 21. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to go to medical school. And I went out for a jog to kind of clear my head and came back in the house. And I walked by my dad's study and I heard him talking on the phone. And I heard him say my name to whoever he was talking on the phone. And I heard him say, Yes, my daughter Meg will be going to medical school in the next year or two. And I stopped dead on my tracks. I thought, What does he know that I don't know? Mm -hmm because I've gotten all my rejection letters. But when I heard my dad say that I would be doing something, I knew in that moment it would happen because mm. my dad said it. Mm. And the interesting thing about that is, as I talked to my dad about that years later, he doesn't remember saying that, but that moment changed my life mm. because it, it gave me the sense that if my dad believed I could do something, the sky was the limit. And mm -hmm. that's how huge dads are in the lives of their daughters and their sons. I think we, so many of us have a, a memory of that, of some line from our father. Yes. And, uh, <coughs> and you base that, the, sh the reason it strikes so much is because they have a natural gift or call to be in a position of authority. They do. Yeah. And I tell dads that they're, they have an authority in a child's life that nobody else has. It's an authority with a capital A, if you will. And that is their, their dad's, when a child's born, dad is larger than life. Dad is the smartest person. Dad is the strongest person. Dad is the most capable person. And children look to their dad that way. And it takes a lot in a child's eyes for a dad to be knocked down off the pedestal, if you mm -hmm. will. And I think it's important that dads know that because you're right. Dads in our culture are marginalized. They're beat up by the media. They look mm -hmm. dumb. Try to find a nice Father's Day card. It's kind of hard. You know, they, mm -hmm. dads, if you, if you came to America and read Father's Day cards to figure out what American fathers are like. They drink too much beer and they hog the channel changer. Yeah. You know, that's about it. But fathers are so enormous in a child's eyes. Mm -hmm. And as a pediatrician, I've heard the hearts of the kids. So I really feel that it's important for dads to understand their enormity and their power, if you will, in a kid's life. And you also talk about uh, dads have a special role as teachers, right, to their yes. children. Yes, yes. A child's identity is shaped by watching their father and their mother. Mm. But a child watches their dad's body movements. They watch their dad's <coughs> language. They listen to the language. So while dad doesn't even know it, he's teaching his child mm. A, how to live, and B, he's teaching a child about himself. In other words, if a child perceives that dad likes him and dad's happy with him and mm. dad's proud of him, that child internalizes that and the child believes they are worth being proud of and that they are very smart and they are very strong and that really literally shapes the child's identity. If you will, dad's beliefs about a child just come into the child and that, that becomes them. So that's an enormous responsibility as dad as teacher. So it's not just what dad says, but it's the daily moments. Kids are constantly scouring their dads for mm what dad thinks about them because you know kids are very egocentric so they're constantly reading their dad for information about what dad believes about him. Mm -hmm. Isn't that even apparent when when our kids are little yes. and they draw a picture and they bring it and they say look what I did yes. and there's a, a look in the eyes as if waiting for that approval that confirmation that what they did even if you can't quite make it out you don't know what it is Yes. because the, they're so young still but there's something that just they want to see dad light up with some sort of approval. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And they want you to approve that, you know, what they did was wonderful, that they're capable. But really, you know, that's the moment where you know they're looking for your approval, but they're looking for that same approval all the time, mm -hmm. but not coming to you and asking for mm -hmm. it. Because they're reading for you, you know, if a, a dad comes in at the end of the day and a, and a little girl's home from school and dad walks in the house within, 15 seconds that daughter will figure out what kind of mood dad's in and she will figure out is he happy with me 
it, and, and if dad is happy and he's in a good mood and she's okay, then she can go on about her business and play. But if dad's not, then her life's on edge a, bit, a little bit and she needs to run out of the room and, and go hide. So, you know, dads have an enormous impact on their kids every every day, every mm -hmm. moment, whether they ask for approval or not. I remember uh, talking to a high school girl in, you know, years ago in Colorado who was having some struggles and um, I had asked her right away what her relationship was like with her father, as I'm sure you know, you know uh, just as well or better that that's an enormous part of the conversation you can have with a child who's struggling with something. And, and long and short of it is that the girl said, well, yeah, I, I get along with my dad. And, and I said, well, does, it, does he tell you he loves you? Yes, he does. And I said, well, do you feel like anything's missing in there? And immediately she started to cry. She said, he never tells me he's proud of me. Yeah. It, it was yeah. that, that kind of confirmation or, or af affirmation of her he never tells me he's proud of me, started crying. So that night I went home and told my daughter's proud of her. Yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. And my sons, and still will, do today. I will tell you, Doug, <laughs> I interviewed a lot of adult women <clears throat> for the book about their dads. And I got one of two responses universally. Women either burst into tears when I asked them, or they gushed about their dads. There was no middle ground. Mm. Oh, let me tell you about my dad. <laughs> I can't wait to talk about my dad. Or I'd hear this pause on the other end of the phone. I don't know if I can talk. I don't know if I can talk. You know, we worry about the influences in our kids' lives all the time. We worry about bullying. We worry about their soccer experience, football experience, whatever. But I tell parents, you know, 45-year-olds don't end up in a counselor's office because of something their teacher did or their teacher said. Mm -hmm. It's because of what dad said or didn't say. Right. So that real that goes back to that authority. In a child's know. life. You also talk about how the fathers teach uh, the children how to relate to other men and to maybe authority and ultimately yes. to God, right? So. You know, a dad sets a template. I, I like to think of it over a child's heart for how that child will relate to men. If you think about it, a, a dad is a child's first introduction, a girl, a daughter, for instance, to male love. And so if a daughter is picked up when she's young and is um, given affection by her dad, she learns to trust a man, she hears his voice, she learns to r realize that male love is a good thing. So a dad really in those early years teaches a child about masculinity and male love and the whole male character. And the child is so simple, if the, ex if the experience is positive, mm. then the child will go on to have better relationships with her brothers, teachers, boyfriends, pastors, priests, and ultimately God. Mm -hmm. And that's an enormous responsibility when you think about it. If a daughter or a son has a bad experience, mm -hmm. how are they gonna relate to a male God in mm -hmm. Christ or God the Father? And it's no wonder that so many young people out there now struggle having a close relationship with God when they either, either didn't have a dad or they had a dad who hurt them so deeply, they want nothing to do of a, of, of a mm -hmm. male God in Christ or Father God. Mm -hmm. So really a dad sets that, the, is, is, and I say that dads are the most important man in a child's life. Mm -hmm. And it's hard you know, for a lot of men to hear, you know, particularly husbands, but it's because a dad teaches a child how to relate to men for the rest of his or her life. Right, right. I, I heard a speaker one time even describe it that the father will almost introduce the child to the outside world. Mm -hmm. you know, like sometimes he's going off to work or whatever. And I, I was talking to this guy, he was a father of 10, and he was telling me, he's, his, his oldest entering college, and I said, how was the teenage years? And he said, he, said, I, he loved it. Yeah. He said he became, it seemed like he was really called upon, you know, he's driving his daughter to colleges to show her different places, and, and they're asking him more about what he does at work and all this kind of stuff. And he, he really felt like his gifts were yeah. coming. Well, that. I agree with him. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I love the teenage years, mm -hmm. and I think my, my husband would probably say the same thing. But I think that if you as a dad look to your kids and decide you're going to enjoy them, and kids think you want to be around them uh -huh. and you enjoy their company, then teenagers will draw closer to you and they will engage you uh, about amazing things. You have mm -hmm. wonderful discussions. You can have discussions about God and theology. And again, I think that teenagers are kind of 
beat up in our culture too. Mm -hmm. When you think of, a, you just say the two words American teenager, you think of somebody who's kind of derelict and the pants are low and they're you know, got piercings all, all right. over and they really are not interested in anybody. Yeah. Well, that's not really not fair be because a lot of teenagers are not like that and they mm -hmm. want to be closer to their parents. Yeah, they want their independence, but the teen years can be a great time. And I will say when we're talking about dads, teen years for boys are all about dad. Mm -hmm. but because boys are very visual, they need to see a good man mm -hmm. to become a good man. Well, let's talk some about that role, the father and the son. What does the son look to dad for? Well, the son looks to dad, I even from the time he's, he's very young, with the questions, am I, am I worth anything? Am I valuable to mm -hmm. you? Am I lovable to you? And am I capable? Mm -hmm. And he looks to dad to answer those questions. And so if dad doesn't answer those questions, yes, you're valuable to me. You're, yes, you're capable mm -hmm. of succeeding in anything. Right. And yes, you're worth my love. If a dad communicates and answers those questions to his son, that kid is on solid ground. Right. But if those questions aren't answered, that boy will turn into a man and constantly try to have those questions answered. Mm -hmm. And there are many adult men out there still trying to prove, dad, 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 mm -hmm. am, I, am I able to succeed in <coughs> your eyes? Yeah. I, I, I want to tell you just a brief story about myself on that exact point. You know, I'll, I'm almost 49. When I was about 15 years old, I was playing football in high school and um, I had been injured in practice and I had hyperextended an elbow shoulder area here and was in a sling for 10 days. And I was pretty small at the time and, and uh, was told by the doctor he recommended I probably stop playing. He says, you know, you're probably gonna get beat up pretty good. You're not really built for this. Went home, to tell my father, and he was, you know, doing a little work on the on the back door, fixing the doorknob. And I don't say this in any way to put my father down. My father um, was 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 an alcoholic, mm. and had many struggles in life. And I don't think he was ever taught anything from his father. Right. So, my father has passed away over 20 years ago, and I pray for his soul. He was a good man in many ways, but he struggled with the alcohol. But he said something to me when I was about 15 that I carry with me today, 49, almost 49. He said, "I told all my friends you were going to be a big football star, and you went and let me down." Oh. And then he went right back to working on the yep. doorknob. Mm -hmm. And I still feel that, feel that. like he mm -hmm. said it yesterday. yesterday. Yep. Now, I don't wallow and weep over it, but in here, there's still something there but that, I, but that I hurts think, a bit. But I think that the most important thing is to recognize that you had a need for your dad's approval, right. that you didn't get it, and now God can, gives you that approval and you can heal and move on. Yeah. And I think where men get into serious trouble is where they refuse to recognize that they have that dad hurt, mm -hmm. that they never had that blessing from their dad, if you mm -hmm. will. And they say, oh, it didn't bother me. I didn't have a dad and it's okay, it didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. It bothers them tremendously. But yeah. when we're willing to acknowledge that and bring that before God and ask God for healing, he does heal, and, and then you can talk about. And it. you're right, Meg. That's that's what that's exactly what is what has allowed me to move forward, and and now go out and even speak to men about mm -hmm. these things, and not I don't have hold anything ill against my father. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I do keep a prayer in my heart for him all the time. Uh, but you're right, only because of God, the mm -hmm. Father of the fatherless. Right. You know, that's who He is, and Saint Joseph's intercession as well. Yeah. Yeah. And He's the Father of broken fathers right. too, which right. is <laughs> great, great. And I and I tell men, you know. Ha, being a Catholic and a Christian faith is, is the best news for any dad out there because you're not going to do it perfectly, but guess what? Mm. You got really good backup. Right. You know, God will come in and he'll fill in all the yeah. holes. And yeah. It's a great wingman. Great wingman. <laughs> well, we're going to talk more about the, yeah. the repenting beginning again. And when we come back, we'll take a short break, so don't go away. <laughs> Hi, welcome back. We've been speaking about the influence of dads, uh, fathers on their children. And you know, one thing that strikes me in, your, in the book uh, was some of the simple lines that we say. It's, and 
you know, it could just be a simple <coughs> statement the father says that has such an impact. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes dads get intimidated, like they have to have this great understanding, great knowledge about child, child psychology, they have to get it just right. Yeah. Tell us about that aspect. You know, I hear from men all the time, they'll say, well, Dr. Meeker, I have a question. I know I'm probably not doing a very good job, but, and I say, stop, how do you know you're not doing a good job? Because in their mind, they have, a uh, role that they feel they need to play and it usually has it's all performance based I need to earn more money I need to make sure my kids fit in with their classroom their mm -hmm. clothes are the same so and so forth but really <clears throat> being a great dad or being a good enough dad is very simple mm -hmm. it's very simple you just have to get the big stuff right mm -hmm. you have to communicate to your child that they are everything to you they are your son and your daughter, and nothing will ever take that away, and they will always be your son and daughter, and no mm. matter what, even if they just sat in the closet the rest of their life, that could not shake your love for them. Mm. Uh, and you communicate to them that you, you are given to them by God to help them navigate a really hard culture. Mm -hmm. You know, kids are taught through school, and even physicians teach kids, that parents are the enemy, that, you know, Parents really don't understand kids, so they gotta come to the doctor and we gotta get the parent out of the room and teach the kids. Well, that's terrible. But to teach them, I'm your ally, I'm here for you, I'm the teacher. Mm. And, and you know, communicating those very simple things to kids is mm. what gets, it, it is 90% of great parenting. And any dad can do that. Right. Because God wires dads to do that. We just need to put a little spark to their electricity and let them go. <laughs> it, by the way, dynamic, and right? by the way, there are many times that women sabotage dads. Now you will want to do a whole show on this, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but women sabotage fathers all the time because mm. we're very possessive of our kids. We're very controlling of our kids. We feel that we know best from breastfeeding right at the beginning mm. and keeping dad away till they go off to college. And the message we give dads is, get out of the way, I've got this covered. Mm -hmm. I found myself doing that. So we need to back off and let dads do what they do really well. And I believe that God makes it intuitive for a lot of men, but men are afraid to act on their intuition. Mm. Right. They're afraid to be protective, you know, afraid to yeah. put down some rules, afraid to tell how their daughters how to dress. And they have to be, they have to persevere in the battles. Exactly. Right, not run they away They have to be a battles. warrior. Did but they're born to be warriors. <laughs> <We're> yes. <laughs> my battle ready t shirt here. Yeah. You know, you mentioned about persevering and, and being afraid. Um, aren't a lot of parents really concerned um, of the rebellion, the, the age of rebellion? Because everybody seems to think that, that a child's going to rebel as if it's a genetic defect, yes, that yes, they're, they're just yes, going to rebel. Yeah. Yeah, the, the whole idea of the teen rebellion is really an American culturally contrived phenomenon. <laughs> it's not biblical, and it doesn't happen in other cultures. Mm. Again, it's this sort of paradigm that we have created. Mm. We look on teenagers as crazy and, and uh, hard to talk to. They don't want anything to Teenagers need their parents more than toddlers do. Mm. They really do. I mean, mm. anybody can keep a toddler protected, but the teenager needs to know what the parent thinks of them, what they want for them. Mm. Yes, we have to parent differently, and yes, we have to give some independence, but we can ne we should never parent in fear. God did not create us to parent in fear. Mm. And I enjoyed the teen years, like your friend mm -hmm. did, more than any other year, at years with my kids. And so, I, again, it's what your expectations are. If you expect your kids to be good and to want you and to be wise and to make good choices, even though they fall, um, and, that, and you communicate to them that you want their company, they will become people whose company you'll want more. Right, and you make a great point in the book about being present and listening. Yes. Especially when it comes to the daughters. Maybe we can shift sure. to the father's role with the daughter. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think that in many ways, dads are better listeners with their daughters. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they are with, with sons mm -hmm. as well. But when I would talk to my daughters, when a mother will talk to your daughter, you'll ask her a question, she'll answer the question. While she's answering the question, you're thinking about your next question. You're yeah. not paying any attention to her question. But I find that dads will listen and pay attention a little bit more, but it's extremely important to listen to a child, a daughter, whether she's five or 15 or 25, 
because it makes her feel valued, that her opinion is valued. Now, you don't have to agree with her. You can think her thoughts are crazy, but just listen and take it in. And if you want to correct her, correct her a day or two later. But let her have her say right. that that is so enormous and I think if parents could learn to do that it would curb so much heartache and so much distress in a teenager's life because so many times kids act crazy because they really believe nobody cares about what they have to say or how they feel. They're not being heard. They're not being heard. Right. It's fascinating to, to see what you've written about the relationship, how, how the daughter uh, sees her father. Can you tell us about that relationship. In particular? Well, I write um, a lot in the book about, I, I, I believed that in writing Strong Father, Strong Daughters, that if I could help a dad sit behind his daughter's eyes for just a few minutes, his life would never be the same. Because as I said, he parents according to what he believes is the right thing to do. But when a daughter looks at a dad, she sees him as the authority, she sees him as her, a hero. And I tell dads that, and they say, oh, I can't do that, I'm not a hero. But what they think is, I can't play football, I'm not a basketball player, I don't make a lot of money. I, I said it's nothing to do with that with a, with, a teen, with a girl. A hero to a daughter, she looks for you to be somebody who doesn't lie, mm -hmm. who comes home every night and is, wants to eat dinner with them, who's a good man, who loves his, her mom really well, mm -hmm. who is kind and who is patient. That's what a hero is to a daughter, and that's when a daughter looks at her dad and sees a hero, that's what she wants to see. Mm -hmm. So if he delivers on those things, not even every day, but just some of the time, he stays her hero. And that reminds me too how the faith can help us so much to get out of the values of the world, thinking we have to provide X, Y, and Z and do all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And she's looking for something, you're saying, much different. Completely yeah. different, completely different. And parents today, particularly in, in America, <clears throat> Uh, particularly mothers live on what I call the crazy train. We have become performance crazy. Mm -hmm. We feel that our job as parents is to make sure our kids get in enough sports and have enough stuff and live in enough home and go to the right school and are in the fast reading group, not the slow reading group, and mm -hmm. that they eat organic foods, not fast food, and so on and so mm -hmm. it goes on and on and on. But that really isn't what, it's, what being a great parent is all about. Our commission, if you will, is to raise good people. Right. good kids with strong character. And the way we raise good kids with strong character is to live good character in front of them. Not only does that cause them to be good people with integrity and honesty and trustworthiness and faithfulness and, and, and to grow up to be kids who love the Lord, but it also, um, it also shapes their identity and, and gives them s solid, ground to stand on. It makes them strong people. Because kids understand when parents are just trying to do a lot of stuff for them, kids begin to feel like they're little marionettes on a puppet. Mm -hmm. I've had kids say to me, I can't stop playing soccer because if I do, my dad won't come watch me and that's the only time mm -hmm. I really see my dad. Mm -hmm. So in other words, kids feel pressure to perform because their parents want them to perform so they can't stop. Right. So parents realize being a good parent and what my kid wants for me has nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. So let's just be home and play some games in the evening. <laughs> That's what kids really want. And the daughters, they especially are looking to be made feel special that yes. you're wonderful as a person, mm -hmm. right, to me. And the daughter, uh, the father needs to communicate that. You know, studies yeah. show that the best way to boost the self-esteem of any girl, regardless of her age, is for her to receive physical affection from her dad. And it isn't making her a better figure skater yeah. or helping her get better grades, but it's, it's being acknowledged by her dad that you are the apple of my eye. And, and if any dad wants his daughter to be chaste, I tell him, give her physical affection, show her that you care and that you love her, and that will take her 95% of the way to staying out of the backseat of some guy's car. Because mm -hmm. we know that girls turn to teen boys for sexual activity, not for the experience, because they want to feel cared about and loved. Even if it's fake, it's better than nothing for a moment. So, you know, dads really need to be involved in a teen girl's life. Mm -hmm. I heard a 42-year-old woman tell me that years ago. She'd had an emotional breakdown 
Um, this was years after she'd had the breakdown, and she said she grew up where the father wasn't very affectionate. He was afraid to hug his daughters because he was afraid he would be accused of something. So right. he just refrained from anything. Mm -hmm. And while she was lying in this hospital bed after this breakdown, um, he came and said, is there anything I can do? And she said, I looked at him and I started to just sob and I said, hold me, just hold me. Um, and I heard another woman, she's in her 70s, say, if I could ever have my dad back, I would just ask for one day mm -hmm. of his time. Mm -hmm. That was it. So everything you're saying, yeah, it's, it, it echoes over and over mm -hmm. in, in the lives of so many people. Well, I will tell you too, my dad um, died with Alzheimer's and my mother and I helped care for him the mm -hmm. last four years of his life. And even when he got to the point, the last six months of his life, he didn't recognize me or know anybody. Mm -hmm. I would still go in and hold his hand mm -hmm. and talk to him and read to mm -hmm. him. And when he'd hear my voice, I'd see tears. And interestingly mm -hmm. enough, when we say the Lord's Prayer, he would cry. Mm -hmm. But for me as an adult woman, just to know, just to have that physical touch with my dad, mm -hmm. it meant so much f for me, even knowing that my dad couldn't say what my, my name was. Mm -hmm. So God works in these relationships in such a mysterious and wonderful way. And I think that that's why we need to really respect them and care for them. And again, it's so simple. Sometimes it's just a matter of touching your girls more that right. will keep them on the straight and narrow in high school. Well, let's talk about, too, the realities that, you know, we all have struggles and maybe dads are sitting at home or a guy's thinking about getting married and say, well, I got so many issues. Can I really do this? What about those failings? Maybe they struggle with drinking or pornography or something. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're all broken people mm -hmm. and parents will make a lot of mistakes with their kids. And I think it's very important to let kids know that you're doing the best you can that your heart is in the right place. Mm -hmm. And if they are struggling with something like alcoholism or drinking, mm -hmm. it takes the relationship so far if you go to the child and say, you know what, honey, I'm having a problem and it's really hard for you and I'm gonna do everything I can with mom's help or dad's help, mm -hmm. whoever it is, to fix this problem because I wanna be a better dad for you. That child will forgive you before you even admitted your problem. Mm -hmm. A child wants so much to forgive their parent because again, they're attached to that parent by a need-based love. They need that parent's love. They need their parent to, to, to want to try more. So a child is so forgiving. Mm -hmm. I, I tell dads that every woman takes one man to her grave and it's her dad. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to, we were talking about, you know, women either gush or they cry over mm -hmm. their dads. And that is they either want more healing from their dad because he never said, I'm so sorry I hit you mm -hmm. when I was drinking too much, mm -hmm. or they want more time with their dad. So, you know, kids are so forgiving and they want to forgive, but you just need to come to them and say, here's what I'm struggling with. You're not going to fix my problem. God and I will fix my problem, or mom and I will fix yeah. my problem, but I just want you to know I'm doing the best that I can. Right, right. It's huge for kids. So again, it's not like this perfectionism no. that the world gives us. It's being present, kids, listening. And, you yeah. expect yourself mm -hmm. to be perfect. Your right. kids don't expect yourself to be the, you to be perfect. Right. Again, it's very, very simple. Right. And you're a mother of four. So four, you, yes. You know what you're talking yeah. about. And a grandmother. And I'm and a, a grandmother. grandmother. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll take a quick so. break. Be back in a minute. Yeah. Welcome back. Let's uh, shift over to moms now. Let's see sure. how moms play with their sons and daughters. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Mothers play a very different role than fathers do. <clears throat> and every child needs, because every child, whether they have a mom or dad in the home or they don't, they know they have a mom and they have a dad. And every child is driven to know about that person. Mm -hmm. And they want to know why you're not there. And this is one of the things that's really hard for me to talk to divorced couples about, um, particularly if his dad's getting pushed out, is that 
children need their mom and they need their dad. In the early years of a child's life, <coughs> say zero to eight, mm -hmm. particularly in a boy's life, life is really about mom. Mom sort of gives a son uh, a sense of emotional security. She kind of gives him an emotional language. She <coughs> helps to teach him to be comfortable with himself. Mom is a safe person. Interestingly, kids perceive mom's love as a non-negotiable love. It's just always going to be there. And that's why I tell mm -hmm. moms, kids can beat up on us so badly because they really believe we're never going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Dad, on the other hand, has a choice in a child's mind. And, you know, dad, they have to be a little more careful because dad could leave and they have to please dad. But mother just gives that security mm -hmm. that, that, and again, it doesn't necessarily depend on the personality of the mother or the father. Mm -hmm. This is a child's perception. Mm -hmm. So we need to know what the child's perception is so that we can parent according to that. So mm -hmm. mom is sort of the comfy couch, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then as that <coughs> child transitions, the boy particularly out of the early years mm -hmm. into 10, 11, mm -hmm. he begins to separate from mom because he loves mom, he's connected to her, but he's a guy and mm -hmm. he doesn't know how to do this and mm -hmm. he doesn't want to be, but he does want to be connected. So, but he needs to be a man. So then he pulls himself away and he does what Bruno Bettelheim used to say, he kills off his mother. Mm -hmm. And um, as a mother of a son, I was really happy to read that because I felt like I'd been killed. Off. <laughs> you know, it was a of, who is this kid that just walked down and said, he hates me. He hates mm -hmm. I remember telling my husband, he hates me. He hates mm -hmm. me. And I, you know, I poured my mm -hmm. life into him. But they need to do that so that then they can grow up and then when they're in their 20s and they can reconcile, I am a man, mm -hmm. I can love my mom, mm -hmm. and it's not so creepy. Mm -hmm. But the teen years are all about dad for mm -hmm. sons. But So moms give sons and daughters something that's a bit harder to define than what a dad does, but it's very, very important, but it's very different. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about marriage itself. You speak beautifully about what uh, just the couple being married gives yes. to the children. Yeah. I believe that this is an act of God, and, and I've seen it present in the lives of children who may not even have a faith or whose parents don't have a faith. That for some reason, when children live with a married mom and dad, they extract some of their identity from the marriage. Parents often say, well, if I am a dad and I have a good relationship with my child and I'm the mom and I have a good relationship, that's good enough. But there's something very mysterious that a child gets from the marriage bond mm. that I've seen in kids and they lose it if, if the, the marriage is fractured. There's a tremendous amount of security. Love alone doesn't always make kids feel secure. Right. Knowing that mom and dad are cared for by each other makes a child feel secure. And I'll often say to parents, have, how do you feel when your kids fight with each other? Well, A, they feel like a failure because a good parent would have siblings who get along mm -hmm. in, a, in a parent's mind, at least in a mother's mind. Mm -hmm. So they feel guilty, but they feel very distressed because they don't want their, these two people they love so much to be at each other. And I said, well, you're an adult perceiving that. Now amp that up 10 times, and that's how your child feels when you fight with one another because their whole world seems to fall apart. That security is gone. So the marriage union is, is huge to children. And kids have told me, who have parents who aren't married, they want their parents to be married. And many times they dream about their parents getting back together, but they, they want that security. And it's not because they love their mom and dad that much. They're very egocentric. They want that security back. So that's what the marriage bond gives their child. And you make a great point, too. We like to say, well, kids are so resilient. But you say they don't have a choice. They don't have a choice. Right. You know, we like to say, we like to think that our kids are resilient yeah. and they can adapt to anything. Well, first of all, some kids in it can adapt better than, to, than other kids. But a whole lot of kids can't. And they don't adapt very well. And, you know, we see anxiety on the rise in kids, teenagers and kids in their 20s. We see depression going up. We see um, a, a lot of struggles, and I see them in my practice because I take care of kids up until 20, age 20. 
And it's very, very disturbing. And I know that parents don't want to say it, 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 my divorce or my issues could be affecting my child. Mm -hmm. But I say that's the beginning of healing for them. So you need to do that. You need to be the adult and say, mm -hmm. my situation and what and my actions may well have affected my child, so I'm gonna do what I can to help them. Yeah. And, and to realize that, that what we do it has an enormous impact on the mental health and emotional health of our children. But the, the, the professional, medical, psychological, professional world doesn't necessarily always see it that way, do no, they? No, no. I mean, they've kind of brainwashed and convinced adults yes. that you can get divorced, remarry, divorced several yeah. times even. Your kids will because ultimately be yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah. But there's no health, there's no good data on that. And, and the thing that upsets me is that as physicians, we're scientists and we're supposed to be looking at good data. Mm -hmm. And I will say this, um, medical organizations, the AMA, the American Association of Pediatrics, are political organizations. And the people who run them aren't necessarily practicing physicians, they're, they're political. Mm. And they will come out and they will present studies that they think are right. And some of them are just bad. But anybody who's listened to children year after year after year like I have, or any psychiatrist, as a matter of fact, some of my greatest supporters out there in the public are psychiatrists because they say thank you for saying this to parents, not necessarily religious people, psychiatrists, because, you know, kids hurt in many ways, and, um, and, and studies on this kind of thing are, are hard because, remember, a lot of the adults who are running the studies may be divorced people, mm -hmm. or they may be people have a, a certain philosophy. And being human, they want the studies to fit their paradigm and their belief system. Kind of a, is a misery well, loves company sort exactly. of thing. Exactly, yeah. and, and kids don't adhere to that. So what I tell parents is, look, just deal with what you have. You know, if you've made mistakes and your children are hurting, you make your kids feel crazy if you don't admit their pain. And if they're in pain because you got divorced, or they're in pain because you yelled, or you drank too much, tell, acknowledge that. Right. And then they know, okay, I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. I should be hurting. Then the child can heal. Right. But I if we keep things hidden in the dark, we can't allow God to heal, and we can't allow to heal. And that's where we need our strength to come through and say, you know what? I really messed up as your mom or dad. I'm so sorry. Right. You really need to name it and claim it. Name it and so claim you it. Can tame so it. they can heal <laughs> and God can come in and do something. Right. Yeah. But but what we do by saying kids are resilient, they can deal with this, you know, they don't need to know where their dad is, they don't need a dad, is we make kids feel crazy because they have this deep desire to know where their dad is and to know why dad isn't there. Right. Even they found that kids who have are products of sperm donation and have always had a single mm -hmm. mom, they found that as adults they'll go back to find the, the, who that man was and what his name was if they can because that's such an internal God-given mm -hmm. desire to know who your dad is. Wow. And even I've heard two cases where even if they just know that their father did try to find them or tried to be present, maybe they failed, but they at least say exactly. that makes a exactly. difference. Exactly. Yeah. It's that dad yeah. wanted them. Right. He, it's on a, some it, level, he it's tried. A, it's a sense of him fighting for them. Yes. Yeah. And, and exactly. we all want to know that someone loves us unconditionally enough to fight, fight for enough. us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be sure to present uh, the joyful, beautiful vision of marriage yeah. to paint that for us. Because yeah. you know, a lot of young people today, they're not even attracted to marriage, right? Because they hear so many bad things. Right. Well, a lot, of, a lot of young people in their 20s and early 30s are afraid of marriage mm -hmm. because they haven't seen it. And being visual people, we need a picture of what right. good marriage looks like. So I think they're very afraid of it. Um, <coughs> pardon me. I make a point whenever a young couple's engaged to say right off the bat, I am so excited for you. I said, I've been married 32 years and I love being married. And they kind of look at me surprised because they don't hear that very often. And marriage is a sacrifice and it's extremely hard, but it's, it, it's so comfortable and it's so lovely and it so, can be so, give you so much security mm -hmm. if you allow that to be, if you make your expectations of marriage reasonable. And I think that a lot of young people make their expectations and a lot of divorced couples put their expectations of marriage so high. Mm -hmm. 
and their expectations on their spouse are so high that nobody can meet them and that's what drives the divorce and if rate faith up. faith can help us with that, right? Faith we're can we're help not making them a God, they're not trying to play God in our life, right? Exactly. If, if, if a wife could understand, you know, your husband doesn't need to be your best friend and he doesn't need to solve your problems and he will drive you crazy and he does do things that, that are gonna irritate you mm -hmm. and you're gonna do that to him, but let's pare it down and figure out you know, what's the good? I mean, yeah. and, and I will tell my married daughters if they'll complain about a husband, but honey, he's a good man. Mm -hmm. And I tell kids who are going to get married, pick five things that are non-negotiable in a spouse. And if that person meets those five things, that's it. What about kids? We've got a minute and a half. Yeah. Yeah. What's been the great joy of your life? With oh, kids? oh, oh. Well, raise, well, you know, I think we're all very egocentric. So having a child that kind of looks like me and that <laughs> sort of acts like me, but hopefully a better version. But, but I'm just being honest, you know, parents like to impart their, the best of who they are onto this person. Yeah, where they show a talent. Hey, you get that from me. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, but yeah. even if they're adopted, we like to believe that we impart the best of who we are onto this little person who's going to grow up and make life better and carry on, uh, carry us on into the future. And, and that's so rewarding and so satisfying. It's also wonderful to know someone that well, to have walked through so much with them and to see them morph into this wonderful adult that yeah. one day looks at you and goes, you know, you're not all so bad, Mom. You were kind of right after all. <laughs> yeah, but that, that doesn't happen until they're in their late 20s. Though. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so thank much. You, for yeah. your, thank you, Father. Thank you, Doug. Wisdom so and faith with us. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Yes. May our Heavenly Father uh, shine his face upon you. May he give you his peace and send his spirit into your hearts. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. See you next time.